Welcome to Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me is Mr. Chris Hellstrom. How you doing today, Chris? I'm doing all right, Jody. I'm yeah? doing all right. How about yourself? I'm doing all right, too. I'm almost pantsless in, in the studio at the moment as we record this. I'm definitely Ooh. shoeless and sockless, for sure. Yeah? I'm kind of going oh. relaxed today. Overshare, bro. <laughs> TMI, TMI. Yeah. Well, so you're having a nice and light, relaxed, groovy day so far, are you? Yeah. I'm actually, last night, I mm -hmm. started making a spreadsheet to track what still needs to be done on a bunch of songs that I'm in the midst of working on. Ah, uh, yeah. And it's giving me the kick in the pants that I need to say, okay, this song needs some concentration right now. And just before we got going today, I was actually working on a transfer of one of the demos from 44.1 to 96K template that I have. Right. So, and speaking of templates, that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today in a sense, because you're yeah. asking me what? I'm asking you what is the biggest lesson that you have learned when it comes to recording or engineering or mixing or anything that pertains to your workflow. Yes. So I'll ask the question, what's the biggest lesson you've learned, Jody? <laughs> the biggest lesson I've learned is using templates and not doing everything in a single file. That's yeah. that's literally that if you are if if that's what you came here for for today's podcast episode, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, we <laughs> we'll can pack see you it next up week. and leave. It's only been two minutes, uh yeah. roughly. Yeah, we're done. Uh yeah. Essentially, I learned early on in the process of doing recording and such, I used to do everything inside a singular logic file. I think a lot of people do that. I'm sure yeah. a lot of people still do that. And there may be some reasons for it and such. Uh, I'm, I've since faded away from doing that. And I know that in past episodes, we have talked about setting up templates and color coding tracks and doing all kinds of things to make your workflow look nice and, and shiny to the eye. <laughs> um, but, but it's a little bit like, you know, you're describing there with your spreadsheet. It, it's, uh, it helps you have control over the whole thing. And you can kind of focus, especially when it comes to, you know, color coding and all that kind of stuff. You get a nice overview of what you have in front of you. And it might be less of an issue if you got like 10 tracks. But if you get above 50 or sometimes not unheard of to be up toward 100 tracks right, <laughs> and more, it can be difficult. So, yeah. Uh, so, I, I think in terms of like just kind of riffing on the, the spreadsheet for a moment, the idea behind that is, is I have too many current projects kind of going at the same time and yeah. I'm starting to lose the drive that I normally have to just focus on one thing at a time and get it done. And yeah. while, a Tell lot me of more. Them, yeah, while <laughs> yeah. a lot of them are very much like near completed there's still a few that haven't been touched in a while and it's kind of like oh i really need to get on top of that so that was the reason for setting up the spreadsheet and going okay on this song this stuff is done this isn't done this is what has been done because part of it too is the fact that i am also playing around with the luna mm -hmm. daw and as much as I am a Logic lover, and I've been using Logic for a very, very long time, since I think version, God, I hate to say it, three? Yeah. <laughs> when it was Logic <laughs> Notator, I think. It was Logic Notator, then it became Logic, then it became Logic. They had a pro version, they had all these different versions, and then Apple finally bought them and something changed. And so, yeah. yeah. Um, in and the days of, uh, was it like silver, gold, silver, and gold, platinum? platinum. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, there's lots of different range or versions of logic. And at that time, the sonic difference between, say, logic and Pro Tools was not grandiose, but logic had a much better MIDI capability with audio than Pro Tools did, sure. which is the main reason that probably whoever, actually, it was Matt Hepworth who is now a video editor of some note who got me into logic 
yeah when i first left music school so <laughs> There you <laughs> Thank go. you, Matt. So, it's your fault that I'm a logic guru at this point. Um, <laughs> so in that regard, I started on logic and I never really gave it two thoughts for the longest time. But now that Luna's out and it's done by Universal Audio and they're generally known to have high quality audio products and high quality representations of everything that they've done. And of course, in the actual hardware world, some of their gear is revered as like the greatest gear ever. And I know that like, <laughs> I think actually it's next week's episode that we're going to be talking about one aspect of a piece of hardware gear uh, that yeah. universal audio has done. Right. And uh, essentially they took, I guess, some of the early day Pro Tools people and have now created this new DAW called Luna as we're going far off the deep end here. Uh, and to keep it shorter, Luna in and of itself, if you mix tracks like between Logic and Luna with no plugins on them, mm -hmm. they sound identical, as most DAWs probably will, because the DAW yeah. in and of itself is just the DAW and doesn't really do anything too much to the audio other than ones and zeros. But right. as soon as you start introducing plugins and the processing that happens within plugins, there is some kind of audio, audio difference that happens between what Logic does and how it takes plugin data and what Luna does and how it takes plugin data and reshoots it out to your ears as audio. And Luna, technically speaking, sounds better using the exact same plugins yeah it's a minute difference you've heard it i've sent you messages yeah. between the two it's yeah. it's not a drastic difference to the point of like the average person is really not likely to notice <laughs> but yeah. if you know what you're listening for you do notice it and it's that extra little one percent it's that little step that we're talking about that takes it from being amateur or regular to being the pro or the upper level kind of thing. And I don't know, you can agree yeah, or disagree yeah. with me. No, 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 no. I, I would say, you know, had I not heard the difference, um, I would have said that it's all in your head. Yes. But, but there's two things. <laughs> I, I, you know, because it is very easy to do that, especially if we're invested in whatever environment that we're in, right? Yes. Whether that's, you know, me in the slate world or you in, in the universe. We, we, people have a tendency to be very protective about their environment. We want that. Oh, this is the good thing. However, all that being said, uh, I did hear the difference. Yes. Th there is a difference and they don't null out, which is the ultimate test, right? Well, so there's so that we test. Do, there is that test, but beyond right. that, there is a sonic difference where, and I think you've said it too in, in our discussions, is that Logic sounds a little bit smeary. It's not a bad mix, Yeah, but it if you compare it to Luna, Luna is almost like you've got a magnifying glass on it and it sharpens the photo or it, sharpens yeah, it, the audio in a way that you can hear things much with a lot more clarity and depth. I think depth is a good word to use. Yes. Um, for that, it's um, yeah, it is there. I can't deny it. there is something there, and, and it's kind of crazy. Uh, but we, yeah, we're getting off track here a little bit. Yes, we are getting about pretty far off because we're supposed so, to be talking about biggest lessons I've learned, and that's actually not the biggest lesson that I've learned is that changing DAWs can help. But uh, more or less, using multiple files in You're the different stages in, in terms yeah. of templates and going through stages of the recording process. So. Yeah. So you have like one yeah. creation writing. I have a tracking template, template, right? And then a mixing you, template and, and then a mastering template if I'm mastering something as well. Yeah. So there's three stages of templates that I have. Right. So and it's also there's well, and I should say there's three stages of templates that I have through two different types of environments, because there is production audio that I do for film and TV things, which is mm -hmm. different from doing artist production. So I have artist templates and I have library or production audio templates yeah for each of the same sta same stages so i have quite a few templates in that regard yeah 
And that was a big deal for me to get away from using a singular file. So what, what inspired you to do that? George Leger. Yeah. Yeah. George yeah. Leger. <laughs> yeah. We'll blame George. Yeah. I'm yeah. Gonna blame George. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've learned a lot from George as well, obviously. Um, George is, is, you know, a very talented individual and, and logic guru of the highest order. Uh, yeah. Both, you know, we both know personally. So, um, but what, what actually made you do the switch? What did you see sort of, was it one of those things from like headspace when you're kind of thinking, okay, I'm done tracking now. Now I, I'm now it's like I'm moving into the mixing phase and I'm not going to worry about adding a 14th mandolin to the pre-chorus, you know, <laughs> uh, or, uh, no, man, it's gotta be a 60th mandolin. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, see, that's what I would have done, but, mm. um, no, but in all seriousness, what what um, what do you think are are the biggest benefits of doing it this way? The biggest for benefit you. that I got out of it, after he kind of twisted my arm on something, had to do more with making sure that I was choosing the right sounds up front. Okay. Because once you hit the mix phase. If you don't have the right sounds at that point, your tracking has failed, I guess is a good True. way of yeah. putting it. Yeah. And I used to spend so much time mixing as I went Yeah. before I switched to the multi-file stage format type thing that I would spend a lot of time like tweaking and then I'd listen and then I would tweak again and then I would listen and I would tweak again and then I'd mix and I'd tweak again and I'd go back and all oh, that sounds not working for me. I need to go change the sound. So I was literally as mixing, I was spending so much time going back and redoing sounds that it was time consuming. Yeah. And I wanted to get out of the time consuming world of constantly changing sounds yeah and get into the world of make the time consuming thing about what i'm hearing getting the balance and the eq and everything else right and making sure that the instrumentation the recording and everything else is as good as it can be the sounds were chosen stop move on to the next step don't keep going back and forth between steps now on occasion I still have an issue once in a while where I get to a certain point in the mix and it's like all of a sudden, oh, this really isn't working. Yeah. Then I'll have to go back, open up the tracking template and change something and then re-output it again and then pull it back into the mix. That's a little bit more of a bummer, but at least it's got me away from constantly fiddling Yeah. while mixing. And yeah. that's probably the biggest lesson is that the mixes while... Uh, their time frames went down and the quality went up. I now extend my mix time to increase that quality level even more, depending yeah. on the type of project that it is. Some projects sure. you don't have that time frame and you're under a deadline and you have to get it done ASAP. Yeah. So I, I think those are very, very good points. I mean, because when you say that, I'm thinking of two things. It, The first thing is that it forces you to make a decision yes. uh, about a certain sound as you're tracking. And decisions uh, are a good thing. Especially when it comes to mixing, because then, yeah. Uh, and also, um, it um, forces you to think about arrangement earlier on as well uh, yeah. during the tracking stage. So, so you have to pay attention to all of these, make these decisions that um, ideally you want to have as few of those at the mixing stage, right? Because then you can just make sure whatever's there, make that sound as good as possible. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think if you need any more selling points than that, then it's like <laughs> nothing else is going to do it for you. But, but, yeah. um, but, but it can be, you know, the, it, it takes a little bit of experience, I think, to to know what it is that you're going for sound wise or whatever it's if it's a keyboard part or if it's a, you know, bass part or if it's, you know, a guitar part or whatever. But um, I think that that's a really, really good reason to do that. 
Um, and we talked about it in workflow when we're tracking and stuff in, in earlier episodes where yep. we've said things like, you know, um, we just have that Eddie Kramer type of thing, right? And, you know, make the decision. Don't kick the, the decision in front of you until, you, <laughs> until it's too, too you're forced to make it, right? Right. Don't keep kicking the decision down the road. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So at what point in this process do you sort of like do any kind of cleanup that we've talked about in the past, whether it's like noises in files or vocal files or any tuning that might be done or anything like that? Do you do that as you're going from your tracking template to your mixing template or how do you? Yeah. That? Yeah. That that's the stage at which all the cleanup tends to happen mm -hmm. is done tracking. Okay. Do the editing then export this, the individual stems mm -hmm. of each individual track and send it to the mix template. And also it's a little bit dependent upon the artist. Some artists need something comped. Like let's say you're working on a vocal and mm -hmm. you have to do a harmony and they're not the greatest at nailing the pitch he goes okay. this does happen yes and instead of having them sing to something that's not in the greatest of pitch or time it might behoove me at some points to let the artist take a break mm -hmm. spend a little time comping spend a little time tuning then have them come back and continue on so it depends more upon the artist if it's somebody that really knows what they're doing and that's not necessary oftentimes they don't need to hear the other track that their vocals or anything that they're singing to and you can just mute those out and know that you're going to comp and do whatever you need to later before the bounce to the mix phase uh yeah so i it just it's dependent a little bit upon the artist and how they work of where i'm going to be doing any comping and editing in the process yeah but assuming that this is you're still doing some tracking so this was all yeah that's still all during the, the tracking, tracking phase. template but right. but, uh, but in terms of getting to the cleanup and going to the mix that more often than not 90 98 percent of the time is going to be tracking's done time to export and go out to the mix template right and so that's when track cleanup other noise cleanup uh tuning cleanup timing cleanup whatever needs to happen mm -hmm. that happens at that phase that point just before exporting from the tracking template to go to the mix template yeah so i just thought of something here when uh -oh. you're all oh i know right <laughs> be careful uh i might hurt myself um at what point do you do your archiving of, of when a project's projects? done? Right, but, but do you do that based off your mixing template so that this is all the cleaned up files? No. no. So uh, unlike, here's another thing that got me. Well, Logic has done something, or I should say not Logic, but Apple has done something. And Luna's kind of followed suit, which is a little bit annoying, and they've taken it to an extreme. Okay. And hopefully enough people complain that they don't do this in the future. Hopefully they'll add additional functionality. But Logic gives us the ability to either save as a singular file that everything is contained on the inside of it, and you can just move that one file all over the place. Yes. Or you can save your project as a folder yes. that then has multiple folders in it, plus you can put multiple Logic files inside it. Mm -hmm. And... The singular file thing, I don't know what version of Logic that came in, but prior to that version, it was always project folders. It was yeah. never one simplified file. I think and it was a 10 thing. Was it a 10 Logic thing? Logic 10, yeah. yeah. Maybe. I don't remember. Could have been could have been before that. I don't recall because I don't use the singular Logic file. Neither do I. <laughs> it is way too annoying and if you're trading files with somebody across the internet and i've had to explain this to artist friends who are getting into dipping their toes into the recording process and wanting to work remotely with other people mm -hmm. 
they usually start out with that single file version of logic when they're working in logic. And that's problematic yeah. because they'll be sent some files, they'll record their stuff, and then they send that file back. What that does is that that now creates two files for the other person, and they have to then somehow lift the new files out and put it into theirs kind of thing. Yeah. Especially if they're working concurrently, that creates problems with the archive version of a logic file. Now, I'm not sure of all how all the other DAWs do it, but Luna is in that situation where everything about a particular song file is in a Luna file inside a folder. And, yeah. and it's not in a folder. It's like all your Luna files are for every song, every project is essentially in the same Luna folder, but they're all contained into individual project files that you then, if you wanted to go in and like, just take a particular guitar track and send it to somebody, it's not an easy process. And it's named, it's not named what you called it in the Luna file. Oh, that would drive my OCD it, oh, crazy. It drives me <laughs> nuts. So it's like, I can't track in Luna for that reason. Because yeah. I don't have granular control of what, you know, especially like when you and I are working, it's like yeah. we're flying files back and forth over right. the server. And it's just like, it's, there's no way to do that with Luna. And there's no way to do that in any kind of DAW that is archival to a singular file. It's just too difficult hmm. in my mind. So I save things in a project folder. And inside that logic folder that it creates for the tracking template, you can then create additional logic files without folders. Sure. And like, so I'll have the name of the song and maybe tracking on the end of it for the tracking version. Then when I'm ready to mix, I will dump all the stems out to another folder inside mm -hmm. that called stems for mix. Mm -hmm. And then I will create the, or I will open the mix template and then I will save it into that songs project folder like song name mix. And then if there's like multiple versions of the mix, it'll get a mix plus a one or a one a or one B or two or three or whatever version of the mix it's getting to. And then that will actually say, I will save the project file of the two tracks that happen from that to yet another folder inside that songs project folder called mixes. So that mm -hmm. when I output the mixes from the template, they go into that folder and not into the audio files folder of tracking. Right. So then from there, if I'm sending it off to a mastering engineer, I have my, my mixes very easily can be grouped in from that mix folder with the song title on it and send it off to the mastering guy. Or if I'm bringing in mixes to master, then I send it to, uh, you know, to a mastering template, which I then save into that project folder. And at that point, I created yet another folder for masters. So sure. everything's very highly organized and easily right. to get to inside a singular audio pro or singular, singular song file, project file folder, I guess is the best way, excuse me, best way to say that. Yeah. So, so that would be the my, process. Right. But I'm saying when you're doing your actual backup, when, you, when it's going into cold storage, my... my my question was kind of like, well, presumably you have a lot of tracks and takes and things in the tracking template that yes. are no longer of use. Do you do any sort of like consolidation there or any cleanup or any of that? Or do you tend to kind of like delete those as you go? Okay. So in a galaxy far, far away, a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> for the Star Wars references, uh, I, there were times when I was using the singular file format and it was way more expensive for hard drive space and backups and all that kind of thing where I did consolidate things. Yeah. Do I miss those files that I consolidated from? Probably not. Yeah. However, now with the new methodology of using a singular project folder that houses the tracking template and the tracking files and the mixing template and the mix stems and the mastering file and the master stems, I just group them all into that folder. And during the process of tracking, during the process of mixing, during the process of any step that I'm going through, 
I have a hard, a second hard drive that I use for immediate backups. And when I'm done with something, I save it and then I drag that folder onto the backup hard drive and then lot or Apple's operating system now has a real nifty function that if anything is changed, you can hit merge on the backup and it won't re-backup anything that hasn't changed. It will only add anything that's modified or new to the backup. The change, yeah, the, so, anything that's changed. Yeah. yeah, so that's a nice way to do immediate backups onto a second hard drive as the process is going along because I have had hard drives fail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In the process yeah. of working on something and then you lose everything and you don't have a backup immediately, you're in trouble. So to prevent that issue, I use a second drive that I am constantly doing backups to during the process of everything. Once a project is considered forked and done, yes. Not only do I leave a permanent copy on a permanent hard drive backup, I make multiple copies into other formats. And with Git, folder sizes now are getting to the point of I don't know, 30 gigs. Yeah. 30 40 50 gigs because when you're recording at high resolution formats, so the size goes up. So that point, I'm going to Blu-ray backups. Yeah. To do. Yeah, you've backups. been doing Blu-rays for a minute, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I've been using Blu-rays for a few years now, and it's a very good format. And then I have a program that I have to unfortunately use a virtual. <laughs> <laughs> virtual machine for because it doesn't work past uh mavericks i think is the os that i've got it running out of to archive it into a bin that spins around and this program treats track of where every disc is and then i can search for a file if i need to bring something out or a project and the little carousel thing will spin up and spit it back out or do you, you know, think and then, would it be a fair statement to say that you'd like to be organized? Yes, I like to be organized. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so yeah. I don't really consolidate things anymore okay. in that regard of like removing extraneous takes and whatnot. Whatever's recorded stays. And if there's a reason to bring something back out, I bring it back out. Okay. And with that, we probably should take a quick break for our sponsors for today's episode. And what's your next question? What is the next thing? My, the next thing I, I would ask is, so we, we've talked about all the, the positives of this workflow mm -hmm. and doing it this way. Do, do you perceive of any drawbacks of doing it this way? Uh, drawbacks, drawbacks. If you're not good at organization, it's a hell of a drawback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, because everything can get discombobulated. If a file gets moved or something gets lost, it becomes a real pain in the arse to go find it. Yeah. Because it's not all in one little neatly wrapped in a bow place. Um, one thing that I used to do that I don't do anymore is I used to actually save samples of the sampled instruments with the project folder. Yeah. Cuz Logic if you're has using the it ability on Logi to do EXS, that. yeah, the sampler, yeah. But I've stopped doing that because I have multiple backups of all of my sampled instruments, so I don't really have a need to save them anywhere anymore hoping that oh my god, they're going to get lost. No, I have massive backups of it. And in addition to that, another reason for not doing it is because of going in multiple steps mm -hmm. in that if I used a particular sound at some point in history in my tracking template, if I'm using the same song file from step one to the step end and I don't export the files as the sounds that they were when I used them, and that plugin is no longer available or that sound is no longer available, I'm screwed. Yeah. Or I have to have an old That's machine fun. that has all that <laughs> stuff installed on it and then I can open it that way. Yeah. But when I'm going from my tracking template to my mixing template and I'm exporting the sounds 
as they were in the tracking template because they are now finalized, I now have the actual sound in hard copy format that I don't require a plugin for anymore because that's the sound I chose at that given point. Right. In other words, you're printing your software I'm instrument. Printing so the there's software no need instrument. to hold on. I'm yeah. printing the guitar sounds. I'm printing bass sounds. I'm printing whatever sound I actually end up with out of the tracking template. So I right. don't need to worry about whether or not a plugin is no longer available or no longer works because there are, you know, when the transition happened from 32 bit to 64 bit over the past three or four or five years, uh, people were freaking out. It's like, Oh my God, I can't use this particular synth. They didn't make a 64 bit version. Yeah. Too bad for you. Yeah. If you're not, you know, exporting your audio as audio and yeah. only keeping just your MIDI data and your plugins. Yeah, so that that's presumably a lesson that you and and indeed me have learned along the way. When that happens to you, you're trying to hold up, open up an old session, and it's like, oh, I don't have this synth anymore, <laughs> this, or this whatever synth it is. Doesn't work in my new OS, damn it. Yeah, <laughs> and oh, and the, the the company went under five years ago. Wow, that that's so sucks. yeah. So they're not going to be doing yeah. anything. And even thirty two lives is that, or thirty two lives. I don't know. It's thirty two lives. Thirty two lives. It's like there was a point in the transition where you had a chance for cats with nine lives kind of things where with yeah. 32 lives by, I believe the company is sound radix. They, I don't know. Yeah. They gave you the ability to kind of take your 32 bit plugin and wrap it up into a 64 bit container that would allow you to continue using your 32 bit plugins for a while. Mm -hmm. But as of Catalina, you can't you, do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. gone. That's like not even a possibility. So, right. yeah. So I, as much as I really loved that plugin, it's no longer available to me and I can't yeah. use certain plugins that I used to use. So now when I go back to tracking templates that have that, I'm, I'm not shit out of luck because I have the sound as printed. Right. But I'm shit out of luck if I need to go modify anything from the original track from the original <laughs> yeah. plugin or whatnot because it's no longer available and yeah. i'm not one of those people that decided to keep old computers lying around just for the sake of being able to run something from 10 years ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah open up that mix from 19 years ago yeah, yeah not yeah not, not the way I was nine operate. you know yeah so. yeah all right Cool. Well, so to sort of wrap up here, the, the using of multiple files or templates in your yes. workflow yep. has allowed you to um, make decisions faster well, yeah. uh, or, or in a perfect world faster. But, but um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, forcing the decision to be made so you're not constantly second guessing it. Yeah, that's the yeah. I, I thing. think that when you when you have the option to second guess yourself all the time, you you're probably going to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, so making that decision has helped you with that. Um, as long as I've known you, I know you've always been a very organized fella. So <laughs> <laughs> this I don't, helps you, know, you with that. You know, the funny thing is, I as organized as I am, I don't feel OCD about it. But it's just one of those things where organization is a big deal. And the reason why I think I got into that process and especially with trying to do backups a lot was to immediately with hard drives and then forking a project and, and putting it onto a more permanent long-term solution uh, had more to do with the fact that there was a point where I had a two album, two CD, 20 songs of original material that I was in the process of backing up when the hard mm -hmm. drive failed. And of course, oh, because it was in the middle of it, it didn't really get anything. Yeah. And I lost 20 songs worth of original material. And at that point, I was never demoing things. It was straight to written version to done. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. with 20 songs of material that you're writing as you're going, and you're just kind of, to put the expression, shitting shit out. Yeah. Uh, I didn't remember any of it. So I lost all of that stuff because I didn't have two track versions. I didn't have interim mixes of anything. It was a, it was a big loss. 
Yeah. And that was the point of like, well, <laughs> I don't want that to ever fucking happen again. <laughs> yeah. I'm that's why you to... just turn off the lights and go have a drink. <laughs> you know, well, that's pretty much what I did. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, at that point, it was like always keep extra hard drives around to constantly make backups as you're going along, not waiting until a certain point and trying to back up everything once a month or every week or whatever. It was like, no, I'm done with this session today. I've just hit rec save. I'm going to move over to the hard drive icons and select that folder and drag it to where it needs to be back up. So that the big lesson is to just work in multiple files and constantly back up. I mean, that's kind of two things, but it, it all kind of goes hand in hand in my mind. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, awesome. Yeah. That was good. All right. Yeehaw. Anything less that you'd like to add to that? Or I think we covered that little puppy quite well there. <laughs> True. Rather in-depth thing of just saying, I use multiple files. Uh, as a two-minute Tuesday tip, maybe I can just kind of quickly show what my Show templates file look structure. like <laughs> yeah. or just a file structure because yeah. it is a little bit uh, daunting for most people. But once you wrap your head around it, you definitely see the, 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 benefit. the benefits of it. Yes. Yeah. So why don't we do that? Yeah. All right, Jody. That. Yeah. Awesome. I think we're going to yeah. wrap this one up, buddy. We'll see you later, Chris. All right. I'll see you later. Have a good day, Jody. Will do. And for everybody out there and inside the recording studio land, we will see you next week where we are going to be talking about compressors. Ooh, I'm excited compressor. already. Which compressor is it? Which compressor is it? I think they're just going to have to wait and listen. Yes. You're just going to too bad. All right. See you next week.